Let me open the first session of the last day's comp uh, for our forum. Um, in this session, Sean Stars is going to make a presentation. He is a PhD student at York University. Yeah. Great, okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much everyone for coming uh, on the morning of the third day, Sunday morning. I was afraid that no one would come and that I'd be sitting in a corner mumbling to myself like I do every morning. Um, so I hope I'll make this presentation worth your while. So in this presentation, I'd like to address a fairly simple question. Uh, what, how do we quantify the qualities of corporate power? So I'll start with a statement. The world's top corporations are powerful. I think this is fairly uh, uncontroversial to certainly to people in this room, but I think to most people in the world, whether you're a CEO or, or someone homeless, I think most people would agree with this statement. Um, but what does it mean? What, what, in what ways do corporations have power over people, society, the environment, and so on? Um, how do we measure this power? Or perhaps more apropos, uh, can we measure this power? And how does capitalist power address these questions? And is this satisfactory? So uh, I'm going to suggest that it's not. So what, what is corporate power? Um, the capacity of a corporation to control, shape, or influence others. So this is adapted from uh, page 17 of, of Capitalist Power. So all my page references are going to be from Capitalist Power 2009. Um, so who are others? Others are individual people, groups of people, other firms, states, governments, the biosphere, society, and, and so on. And, but note that power necessarily involves a relationship uh, between at least two actors or entities. Right? So power in, in isolation from others is, is not very meaningful. So I try to think of the various ways in which corporations have power over people. And I th perhaps the most obvious is direct control through employment, through, through its employees, through its workers. And so you know, we can think of uh, many different ways, many different uh, so power over their actions, their, their thought, their dress, their wages, their leisure time, their work time, their identity, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but does this mean that the more employees a, a firm has, the more power it has? Not necessarily, because, of course, not all employees are controlled equally. So obviously, a janitor will be treated differently than, than a manager, a supervisor, and so on. Um, and not, nor equally in all circumstances in the same firm. So uh, I have a, a Japanese friend that was, that was transferred from uh, Tokyo to Toronto, and he works for the same Japanese firm, but his working conditions in Toronto are much better. He's got more leisure time, less stress, less hierarchy, et cetera. Nor, uh, of course, across different firms. So Silicon Valley firms are famous for uh, supposedly fa for, for having less control and hierarchy in order to encourage the free flow of creativity and so on. Um, so Google has uh, free sports facilities, uh, free massage therapists in their, in their headquarters, free cafeteria so workers can go there anytime and, and get any food they want. So these, these working conditions will be different uh, than a, a mining firm in the Congo, for example. Um, and there's complications regarding outsourcing and subcontracting. So large corporations have indirect power over their suppliers' employees. Um, by pushing down costs, which filters down as, as lower wages. So we can't just look at the, the employment figures, is what I'm, what I'm getting at. It depends on the circumstances. Um, so another form of, of control power that, a corp that corporations have is, of course, control over commodities, both goods and services. So this is control over the, the production, distribution, and, and consumption of goods and services, or in other words, uh, strategic sabotage. Um, but not all commodities are... are as important uh, to human life for others so, th than others. So um, there, are, there are basic needs of human life, so you know, food, uh, medicine, clean water, clean water uh, clothing, shelter, and so on. Um, and so uh, food, I would argue, is more important than consumer electronics, for example, but not in all situations. So after a certain amount of food, uh, we might want some c consumer electronics to help out our lives or whatever. Uh, weapons, so if I'm fighting someone, I would rather have uh, an AK-47 than you know, a copy of the Chronicles of Narnia. But um, in the longer term, uh, ideas 
uh, have greater power than, than weapons, I would, I would argue, against opposition, or at least are, are equally as powerful. Um, we have to look at the degree of concentration. So Walmart, for example, in, in rural uh, Iowa, uh, pulverizes the local retail sector when it, when it enters. Um, so it forces everyone in the, in the vicinity to shop at Walmart, and so Walmart has direct control over what consumers buy and so on. But uh, in Toronto, they have, Walmart has less power because there's much more choice, there's less concentration. Uh, you know, I bike past about four Walmarts, but I'm not forced to, to shop there, there and so on. Um, and so, again, it depends on, on the circumstances. Now there's, there's indirect or structural power. So I'm drawing, we talked about Susan Strange last night over dinner, I'm drawing a bit on Susan Strange conception of structural power. Uh, she's, of course, talking about the state. I'm adapting it to uh, corporations. Um, so the power to shape the environment in which people act, live, think, and so on. So that's the built environment, the social environment, uh, the natural environment. The power to shape state policy or law. Uh, so corporate lobbying, there's some of the presentations talk about the re revolving door between corporations and, and uh, government and of course industry representatives often sit on the very regulatory bodies that are supposed to be uh, supervised or regulating them. Shaping people's preferences or ideas through, through advertising. Um, but there's you know, the famous Madison Avenue uh, saying that half of, <coughs> half of advertising is wasted, but I don't know which half. Um, and also through shaping people's ideas. John D. Rockefeller supposedly said that his, his best investment was, was funding the, the Department of Economics at the University of Chicago. There's degree of, of interlinkages or network power. So for example, if I'm, if I'm the hub of communications, you have to go through me to talk or access other people. That increases my power. Um, so for example, much of the internet is mediated through Google. That increases Google's power. Much of Internet it runs on Cisco servers. 60% uh, of the internet in China runs on Dell servers. Um, and, but I, I didn't, I'm not sure about the, some of the consequences of this. So I don't know what to, to, how to deal with Lehman Brothers. So Lehman, Lehman Brothers, uh, their market capital was collapsing in, in September 2008. And this, this, it went bankrupt and then set off a chain of events that affected much of the world. Is this, is this power or is this weakness? Is this weakness in power? Don't know. So why, why we might consider this uh, power is because if, if we can think of other corporations that collapse in other sectors might not have such uh, drastic effects. So when utilities companies collapse, and it has a regional effect. So in, in August, um, there was a, a blackout in India that affected over 600 million people. So it affected people in northern India, but not not uh, so much outside of that region. Whereas the collapse of Lehman Brothers affected the world. So, summary. So power is relational, necessarily involves at least two actors, entities. Corporate power is manifested in many ways through employment, strategic sabotage, structural power. And so I'm, some of this discussion is drawing upon uh, Joseph S. Nye's discussion of power in his, in his recent book. So he says it also depends on scope and domain. So scope is who is involved in the power relationship. Uh, domain is what topics or which, which space is involved. All right, so how do, we, how do we determine whether these power capacities actually succeed? So, so far I've, I've listed the various ways in which corporations have the capacity for power to shape and control others' lives. But how do we determine whether these capacities actually succeed in desired outcomes? Right, so, um, for example, the U.S. military is, is the most powerful military the world has ever seen, and yet they cannot defeat the Taliban in Afghanistan. Right, so we can quantify U.S. military resources and say it's the most powerful, but um, it depend whether this power can be converted into desired outcomes. We have to we have to investigate. So, how do we convert all these qualities into a single quantum of power? So, when we say uh, for example, that GE is, is 3.73 times more powerful than Honda, we're not only saying that GE has greater capacity, we're saying that it is more successful in using that capacity, right? because power is a relationship. 
OK, so how does Cathal's power address these questions? So I have I, nine pages of, of quotes. I'm just going to throw a few, few up. So as this book will show, the elements of corporate capitalization, namely the firm's expected earnings and their associated risk perceptions, represent neither the productivity of the own artifacts nor the abstract labor socially necessary to produce them, but the power of a corporation's owner. Um, capitalization discounts a particularly trajectory of expected future earnings for any group of capitalists, typically a corporation. The relative level and patterns of earnings denote differential power. Right? So the higher and more predictable these earnings are relative to those of other groups of companies, the greater the differential power of the corporation's owners. At any point in time, the distribution of capitalized values maps the division of power among the different owners. This is a, not a direct quote, a paraphrase. Um, so a corporation with a thousand times higher capitalization than another corporation is a thousand times more powerful. Uh, so there's a, a very memorable fr phrase that Jonathan and Shimshan uh, have in regards to uh, Marxist and, util and uh, utility theory as a value. They say it's, it's logically impossible and empirically embarrassing. So I'm going to assess uh, the power theory value, both try to assess it, both logically and empirically. So logically. So in order to determine or in order to demonstrate uh, the power theory value, either we would have to assume that all manifestations of power have equal weight so that we can add or subtract them. So in, we'd have to assume that all the different ways in which corporations have power over people can be for, given, for example, a value of one. So whether that be the power to kill someone or the power to enforce a dress code, the power to shape a government's fiscal policy or convince women of the need to wear makeup and so on. So all of this has a value of one and we can add or subtract these as these various power capacities wax and wane, uh, thereby approximating the fluctuations in the market cap of these firms. Or we would have to assume that it's possible to rank and quantify the importance of each of these manifestations of power. So I happen to think, for, uh, for example, that the power to kill another human being is the ultimate manifestation of the power to control others. So perhaps we would give that a value of 100. Um, and maybe the power to shape whether I'm going to eat organic granola this morning or Captain Crunch Cocoa Puffs is less important. So that should be given a value of 14.7, and we'd be able to to quantify this and, and add it up. So even if, if we could do either or, we would have to assume that the same power capacity has the same effect in all circumstances and or for all people. Um, but we've already seen that this is not true, so that the same method of power can have different effects in different circumstances or in different people, and, and some of which might be positive. So when a corporation uh, bans smoking near its, its uh, property, that might be disempowering uh, to smokers. It might be a restriction on their freedom, but it, it could be seen as empowering to non-smokers, expanding their freedom. So and even if we assume that all these calculations were possible, we would have to assume that the future expectations of financial analysts are correct all or at least most of the time. So uh, but this is clearly not the case, right? So I mean, if if, uh, if this was the case, then investors would never lose money. But risk perceptions are subject to uncertainty and hype. Right? And as the great uh, theorist Flavor Flav said, don't always believe the hype. Empirically, can we think of instances in which the market cap of a firm declines while its power seems to be increasing? Uh, I think we can. So let's think of. General Motors post-2008, so its market cap was free-falling, and it used, GM used the threat of bankruptcy to uh, exact massive concessions on, on the unions, right? So now uh, the, auto, the American Auto Workers Union, CAW, and now have a, a two-tier labor structure in which all new employees uh, don't have, like, I can't remember the, the numbers, but half the wages of, of current employees, hardly any of the benefits, and so on. So it would seem that General Motors is declining uh, market cap actually increased its power, its control over its employees, and also its, its threats um, of collapse. Was able, it was able to use that to ex uh, exact bailouts from various governments. So not just the American and Canadian government, but also got bailouts from Spain and Poland and, and so on. Can we think of instances in which the market cap of a firm increases while its power seems to be declining? 
Um, so we know that mergers and acquisitions expand uh, the profit st stream of a, of a firm, but the opposite can also be true, right? It's through divestitures. So uh, often when a corporation sells assets, it boosts its profit, not always, but, but often. Um, and this could be seen as a, as a decline in its power because it's, it's, it's a decline so that when its assets are declining, it's the sphere of influence of, of its strategic sabotage is declining. Right? Or, or in layoffs, so if, if it's, uh, the power of corporations over its, over its employees equals corporate power, then what about when its employee, employee numbers are declining? Is that uh, a decline in, in the sphere of influence of the number of employees it has? But often this, again, layoffs boost profit and boost market cap. Right? Okay, so what about highly volatile fluctuations in market value in a single hour, day, week, month, year, et cetera? Is it credible to suggest that power is that volatile? Um, certainly earnings is this volatile. I mean, we can see that that's what fluctuations are. Um, but I think it, it takes a leap of faith to, to believe that these fluctuations are uh, also indicative of changing power, right? And so, um, do we have to use a moving average to, to flatten out or to smooth out these series? If we're using a mov moving average, I mean, who decides whether we use a, a one-week moving average, a one-month, one-year, et cetera? I mean, uh, these are all subjective decisions. What about technical glitches? So Facebook lost $340 million in its um, IPO because of a software failure. Or Knight Capital, I forgot how much money they lost this summer, but they were in deep trouble because of, of software glitch. Or in, I think in the summer of 2010, the Dow, Dow Jones Industrial Average you know, plunged and then, and then increased again uh, rapidly in a single day. Um, are we going to assume that the, the power of dominant capital suddenly plunged in one day and then suddenly increased you know, a few hours later? Or are we just going to use the explanation that everyone else ex uses, which is, is because of a software glitch? So as soon as we start uh, assuming away qualifications and exceptions and so on, we begin to explain less and less, and the elegance of this theory uh, begins to break down. So I'm going to look at, at the corporations themselves now. So th this is the latest list from uh, the Forbes Global 2000. They calculate the market cap. The, the market cap and so on is from April. So actually, the market cap of Apple now is pushing 700 billion, and it's the most valuable firm in world history. Um, and no doubt Apple is powerful. I mean, no, it has uh, influence, control over tens of millions of, of people right, in the world. But is it credible to argue that it, it, Apple is the most powerful corporation in, in human history? Um, so I mentioned that some commodities are more important than others. I think food is more important than, than iPhones and iPads. So Nestle, for example, has control over a huge chunk of the world's uh, food chain in many, many more countries than Apple, right? Nestle operates in far more of the world than Apple does. Um, and yet, according to the power theory of value, Apple is you know, over three times more powerful than Nestle and, and so on. And we can see, um, with Apple, we can see that hype plays quite a large factor. So Apple makes 80% 80 80 of the profit of Exxon Mobile, mobile but has a market cap 1.3 times larger. Um, and I mean, we can go on and on. So Exxon Mobile is no doubt a, a very powerful corporation um, over the environment, over people, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, Chavez was able to appropriate, uh, expropriate Exxon Mobile's assets in the Orinco Bell in 2007. And Exxon Mobile has taken the Venezuelan state to various uh, international courts and so on. And to this, you know, they're trying to get $12 billion in compensation for this expropriation. And yet, they're, they're to no avail. All right, so this is just, uh, I, try, I try to think, how can we empirically operationalize strategic sabotage? So I was thinking, the more assets a corporation has, uh, the greater uh, sphere of strategic sabotage it has. Um, so I, I thought it was interesting that the number one firm by assets is Fannie Mae at over $3 trillion in assets. It's also number 2,000 out of 2,000 uh, by profit. 
and its market value is you know, around 1850. So in, in capitalist power, there is there, there's a figure that, that shows that um, assets and market value are inversely related. And so this would certainly uh, show that. But, it, but it's not the case in, in all, for all firms. right? So Industrial Commercial Bank of China is number 12 by assets and number seven by profit, number six by market value, so, and, and everything in between. How much time do I have? OK, good. I, yeah, I want to leave lots of time for discussion. Um, so my main point. So capitalization is no doubt uh, the formula used to, to, uh, to calculate expected future income. But these and these calculations certainly take into account many power relations. And we can certainly quantify potential power resources. So I can say that Apple has, you know, however, however much profit, it had $40 billion of profit. I can quantify all this stuff. I can quantify. I can say it has this amount of market cap and so on. And therefore, it has the expectations of capitalists that it will make uh, the most income in the future. So I can quantify all that. But whether these corporations can convert these power resources into actual power relations over people is another question. And I don't think we can quantify the, uh, these relations of power, let alone condense them, condense them into a single metric. Um, and we can't quantify this, relate, this power relationship because every, every relationship is ultimately dependent on human will and choice. And that gives me great hope. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to leave lots <laughs> of time for discussion. So any questions, comments will be welcomed by Sean. All right, thanks, Sean. Uh, just one question for, I guess, point of clarification. In the one slide, the first slide on what you saw as the logical problems with capitalist power, uh, you mentioned that we would need an equal quantitative weight, basically, in order to, to measure power and then be able to, to judge, basically, to what extent market capitalization matches um, that empirical weight in quantitative terms. I, I think that's based on a misunderstanding because I think in capitalist power, as I read it, Nitzan and Bickler say quite clearly that there isn't a quantitative realm of power that gets correlated to the quantities of capitalization. That, that logical association is always speculative in empirical terms. So I don't know if you have just thoughts on that. And also about hype. Um, don't uh, the, the idea of, of not believing the hype using flavor flavor. Um, there is a whole section in one of those chapters about developing a hype index. And the point of that is just to say, is it an ex post ex ante? I can't remember my Latin. But in, we can look back on hype and, and measure it quantitatively is the idea. Not that we're taking it for granted, I guess. Um, just if I could get your thoughts. Here. No. I, I don't know. I prefer to take question <laughs> by question so I, I can't evade the questions. But I mean, if there's a lot of questions, and, and then maybe it's better to take them by. No, you can go ahead. Do you want to answer first, or more questions? Okay, so so the the relationship is speculative, um, absolutely. But on the other hand, and so like I said, like I said, I have uh, nine pages of quotes here. But one of them, they're they're arguing that uh, if the market cap of a firm is a a thousand times higher than the market cap of another firm, that its power is therefore a thousand times higher. So they're saying this relationship is speculative, um, and so we have to and we have to try to demonstrate whether the speculation is is correct or not, or feasible, or is or are, are we even able to demonstrate this? And I'm arguing that we're not because we have to assume all these assumptions um, that we can't in order if we're actually trying to demonstrate whether this this uh, speculation is correct that a that a firm with this amount of capitalization has more power than this firm with this amount of capitalization. And that's, to me, is the, OK, you want to? I just, sorry. But the, the language that you use in terms of equal weights and that we'd have to sort of create a hierarchy of different types of power, and so we would assign a value of one to this type of power, and then we'd somehow be able to correlate them, that's just 
wrong, in my opinion. The, it's a qualitative linkage to quantities, right? And so our quantitative realm is capitalization. We link that or correlate that, if you want to use that language, to a qualitative, inherently qualitative realm. And so it's always based on, on speculation. Right, so, but we, we still need to try to demonstrate whether the speculation is convincing or not. Through right? qualitative analysis, yeah. not through equal weights, not through but sort I'm of assigning values. Absolutely, so I'm, but I'm saying that this is impossible, and I think you're saying that, that you're agreeing with that. I am, but I'm saying, I think you're presenting this as a proposition within the book that doesn't exist. No, it, it abs I'm, yeah, I'm not saying that it does, but I'm, I'm saying the, the, the speculative relationship that they're arguing, I'm saying in order to, to demonstrate this, this relationship, these are the things that we have to do, I think. If, if we're trying to demonstrate whether the speculation is, is correct or not. So, I mean, we can, we can make these, these speculative, we still have to, so I, I, can, I can talk about the law of gravity, but I still have to demonstrate it, right? And so I, I think I can demonstrate the law of gravity, right? But I can't demonstrate whether, I can't demonstrate whether Apple has this amount much more power than ExxonMobil because, because of these things and other things. That's my point. That's my point. <laughs> well, if gravity, if gravity is what? OK, OK. I demonstrate the effect of gravity. OK. Yeah, yeah. OK. I've got two questions. I mean, uh, I didn't get quite get the point. You said like something like on the, on the basis of that Nestle has a much smaller market capitalization. Sorry, which? which Nestle, Nestle. Nestle, yeah. Sure, then Apple, that is because, but even though uh, uh, that sector might be more important, but I think there's a confusion on importance of some commodity, some type of commodities and power. I mean, uh, power is, in order language, a degree of monopoly, that is the degree of how you can monopolize certain types of, of commodities. So. Absolutely. The, 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 the uh, sector where Nestle is operating may not be uh, as, as easily ho <laughs> monopolized than the, the, the Apple sector. The, the other thing is, uh, 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 what about importance? I mean, uh, why um, is in a, in a, in a high-tech world um, communication less important than uh, a nutrition, I, I mean, uh, a food? Yeah? So, uh, uh, I think you can't separate this uh, anymore because you have to have to balance it. You have to have a kind of a measure, so to say, for importance or something. I don't see how you uh, do that. And then that's my point, though. Yeah. You can't do that. Yeah. 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 I, I didn't get that. <laughs> okay. So th if we're gonna say that Apple is a certain degree more powerful. So let's, let's be specific here. So Apple is 1.3 times more powerful than ExxonMobil. We have, we have to say that the, the realm of power that ExxonMobil has, add that all up, is less, is less important than the realm of power, so the, in your words, the degree of monopoly that Apple has in that sphere. So if we say that a corporation has um, a high, de high degree of monopoly in uh, this sector and, and, a, and another corporation has a high degree of monopoly in that sector, in order to add that up in, the, in this quantitative way, we'd have to say, we'd have to somehow rank the, 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 impor the different importance, right? Because they're not equally important. And in terms of, so your, your other question about uh, communications is in an advanced society is absolutely important. Um, but there are, in India, there, there are about 40% of the population can't read. And so for them, it's, and they're on the, you know, the, the cliff of survival. So for them, food is more important than uh, communications. I mean, you have to eat first before you communicate. Uh, just a, I guess it's a point of clarification as well. So when you kind of describe in a sense, let's call it just in a general way, the institutional capacity of a corporation. It can do all sorts of things in relation to society. 
Now, when you give that description, I kind of get the sense it's almost, let's describe it as a view from nowhere. You're looking at all the capacities up on the board and you're saying, okay, this is what a corporation can do. But I wonder if you need to maybe, to maybe be thinking more about the way that this approach is trying to get maybe the view from above. So if you're the Pharaoh of Egypt and you sit on your throne or you sit on a big high chair and you say to yourself, this civilization is gonna last forever. It's not going anywhere. That's some sort of degree of confidence about the future of that life. So I'm wondering when you're bringing up things like assets, if you need to maybe take into account that these things are being, like how far are they discounting this? What are they actually doing? So when they amortize an asset, how long in the future are they actually doing it? Are they saying this will be valuable indefinitely? Will this asset, will Apple live forever? So I'm kind of wondering if, I know you're sometimes slipping maybe into this, uh, into the present description, you're saying Apple is more powerful than Exxon or Exxon is more powerful than Nestle. But I'm kind of wondering if the attempt is to try to get a kind of perception of this confidence in the future of capitalism, of these social relations going on forever, or not forever, but you know what I mean, like a confidence in how yeah. long this will actually work. This is, this is the present. And So again, when when you're when you're talking about power in the present or in the future, you you we first have to uh, assume that we can quantify these power relationships, right? So again, we can quantify the resources, um, but whether these resources are are converted into actual power over people and society, yeah. I, but I guess is another question, right? But to the extent that to say. It is definitely the present. You are constantly in the present, but as they say, history continues to flow. So okay. when you're capitalizing something, it's if you recapitalize something, if you're constantly revaluing the value of an asset, you're constantly still looking into the future. So it's, you can, yes, you can take a snapshot of today and you can look at the stock market and you can say, Apple has this market capitalization. And you can freeze frame that, but at the same time, people are constantly asking themselves, what are our future expectations? What is gonna happen to our sales? What's gonna happen to iPods tomorrow, next year? Will iPods be around in 30 years? They're constantly asking these questions. And so I can see what you're, I, like, I, I definitely appreciate the, like trying to like, get at some of these problems, because I mean, we're all trying to maybe think through these, but I get a sense that the kind of reduction to the present is maybe, I'm maybe just a bit confused about that aspect. Okay, okay sure. But even if we're talking about the future though, we, we're talking, you're saying that um, we can quantify the power of corporations into the future or quantify their confidence and obedience into the future and so on. So, so you're, you're assuming expected, that- It's always expected future earnings, not future earnings discounted to present prices. Okay, so even but if we can quantify future, expected future power- Right. I mean, You're s assuming that we can quantify it, and so I'm arguing that we can't. Uh -uh. But what I'm saying is, if I if I own an iPad, if I own, yeah, yeah you know what? Uh, we'll just we'll, yeah. Sorry, I don't want to <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll try to clarify some things, uh, perhaps because uh, I guess uh, the discussion is about things that uh, Shimshon and I did say. Um, I think, Sean, that you are combining two concepts of power and perhaps uh, without actually uh, making it explicit. Uh, one concept of power is, is, a, is the sort of battery notion of power and I think that uh, um, this is a very common uh, perspective in, in the social sciences to think of uh, uh, power is some sort of a resource. It exists, it's an entity in itself and you just uh, basically electrocute people with it. Uh, so you have a container of power and you apply it. Th th I think this is a pre-scientific notion of power, uh, although a lot of people use it. The other notion of power is, is the notion that, that Kepler uh, initiated in 1600 and that's the notion that power is merely uh, a quantitative relationship between entities and the only way we can establish it is by observing its consequences. Now, this is, this is what 
Hegel, 200 years later, would say power is nothing but its effect. So the question are, uh, to me is what society actually establishes as the effect. So I think the first record we have of quantification of power probably comes from Sumer, in which they had a sort of a penal system in which if you basically chop the hand of, of somebody, then there is a certain monetary fine. And if you uh, take out uh, his eye, then something else is going to be uh, imposed on, on you. So essentially, they take different qualities and they impose quantities on them. And that becomes force of power in society because that's the law. Now, if you fast forward into the future, we are thinking, how does the ruling class actually uh, constitute uh, power relations in society. And the way that we can judge whether those power relations or not is if we, A, can convince ourselves that this is how the ruling class thinks, uh, and B, can we as theorists from the outside predict the way the ruling class will behave based on the categories that the ruling class uses. If we do that, we do something similar to what Newton has done. It basically says, I'm going to predict the way God planned the world by saying that gravity is a proportionate to two things. It's proportionate to mass and it is proportionate to distance. So I can predict God's plan based on that. If I can use differential accumulation to predict what happens in a capitalist society and I can argue that basically this measure has to do with sabotage, deprivation and so on because property is about exclusion, I think I'm doing exactly the same thing as Newton is doing. Now, uh, if, if we uh, go back to the page that you distribute here, uh, distributed to everybody, I think it's worthwhile pointing out that you're comparing things that are not at all the same things mm -hmm. while presenting them as if they are the same. And let me try to clarify that. I think it's worthwhile pointing out because sometimes you can make an argument based on wrong premises you conclude something or you draw uh, implications which actually are not based on what you present. So if you look at assets uh, and if you look at market value and profit, what are we measuring? There are two attributes. Ex essentially, what are the categories and what is the time frame? So with assets, you're measuring debt and equity. Uh, the time frame is a backward looking time frame. Essentially, it's a standard measure that says, what was the market value, the forward-looking market value at different points in history that these assets entered into the computation? So every uh, piece of book value was once forward-looking market value, and once you freeze it, it comes as a historical piece. So you're measuring both equity and debt, which is backward-looking and which is very complex because it's staggered. Then you move to market value, which measures only equity, but it's forward-looking. So you cannot compare those things and tell me that the list gives you different results because you're not comparing the same thing at all. Thirdly, yeah. you measure profit, and profit is only part, an element of capitalization, and it's actually more or less the current measure. So one is forward-looking, one is backward-looking, one is current, and each one is measuring a different thing. And which one should you use? Well, it's up to you. And the, the, the criterion for you is essentially to ask, what does the ruling class use? That's the first question. And the second question, which is more powerful in terms of predicting? And I think that you haven't addressed those questions. These are the questions you need to address rather than look back at us and tell us they're inconsistent. Of course they're inconsistent. But they become, the inconsistency becomes meaningful only if you demonstrate that none of them actually gives you anything. If one of them gives you something, you can argue this is a measure of force and power that I'm going to use. But you haven't done any of those things. So can you uh, tell us the obs Can you demonstrate to us the observed consequences of Apple being 1.3 times more powerful than ExxonMobil? Whether Perhaps it's in the I present or in it. the future, or whether it's a flow? Perhaps. I've, I haven't done it. You like to take snapshots of things. And I prefer to actually look at long-term trends. But so we need the things that we have looked at, we actually try to establish a certain predictability. For example, you take the differential accumulation of the oil companies, and you can predict the occurrence of war in the Middle East. So that makes it force. That makes it power. 
Uh, if, if we were unable to do it, then it's a useless concept. It is not force, it is not power. We need to actually substantiate it by discovering certain regularities between the qualitative and the quantity, quantities. Exactly. But, but simply saying that I can show you there are many things you haven't explained, it, it's not really a critique. No, I'm, I'm, I'm arguing that you cannot um, demonstrate this. And so I'm arguing that if we try, this is so all the, the logical assumptions and the empirical inconsistencies and so on. If we try to demonstrate this, that is what we're faced with. We will fail. Sorry? You claim that we will fail. Absolutely. Yeah, okay, that's an open question. Right. Whether we will fail or not. So okay. far, we haven't in what we tried. Maybe there will be things we will fail. I, I do not deny that. But this is just a proposition, it's, it's not a demonstration, yeah. actually. Okay, well, uh, you know, I think it's a, a brave attempt to, it's, uh, to um, um, raise the level of discussion. I, I think that, uh, it, 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 you know, the, the thousand times quote is, is, well, you know, if you pull that out, it becomes a bit stark. Um, so, that, and I think probably that isn't so easily defensible uh, in the way that you're presenting it. But if you're talking about your first, uh, your indirect power and your, uh, and so on, that you, you then, uh, in fact, the criteria of that type of power, then turnover is a better indicator. Because turnover is the power of the corporation to spend in any one year on goods and services, uh, uh, the, the, the amount, so you can have a, 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 a company with virtually no profit, even with not very uh, many assets, but a large turnover, and they still spend that money on hiring and firing people and, and that. So if you wanted to do that, and then if you wanted to correlate uh, turnover to capitalization, then you might arrive somewhere. Uh, so I think that that is missing. The, 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 and especially uh, uh, my, I do a lot of sectoral work. And if you go into sectoral work, uh, uh, and you look at, at the sector, then you can see the, the raw power of uh, the corporation in that sector. And that is to do with all sorts of things, including capitalization. Now, uh, the second thing that I'd like to say is that you, I think it's, to some extent you, you're, missing, you, you kept, you're missing the word corporation's owners. In those quotes, it said the corporation's owners. Uh, and that, of course, in terms of dominant capital, is very important. It's not just that the corporation, it's the corporation's <coughs> owners that have an expectation, and that expectation is, is re reflected in capitalization, and that's in, indeed where I would agree with Jonathan, that of these indicators, that's uh, probably uh, as good as we can get. On the other hand, to quantify power of any sort is almost impossible. And so we can only work uh, with, with what we've got. So, um, yeah, that's a, uh, basically what I want. There was another point, but I've forgotten it. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, don't, it's just a comment. Yeah, no, thank you. Oh, yes, and the other thing, yeah, I, I, I would <laughs> like to argue, sorry, any time empirically with you, because of my knowledge of corporate sector, uh, I, I think Apple is more powerful. Okay. Then, then, uh, then but how do we demonstrate that, though? I think it's more power. And the, how the do we demonstrate that? The way that? you could do that is to use the uh, reductio ad absurdum. So you say reductio ad absurdum. Here is the chief executive officer, Apple, chief executive officer of Nestle, and Nestle says, okay, we won't, make any, uh, we won't deliver any more food in more, or chocolate or whatever in Latin America, and Apple says, okay, we'll stop all our apps and, and, and the whole system tomorrow. W what would happen? And the fact that right, people start, I mean, if you have a liberal conscience, say, oh my God, all those people will starve, what would they do? We don't know what they would do. But we do know that in a modern society, almost all over the world, communications would stop and we'd all be basically dead. So these are all, these are all speculations and we can, we can talk, we can, we can go. If you go, if you take the, the, the I just done a study of the, uh, uh, the alcohol uh, beverage sector. If you go to Mexico, try to buy alcohol, if you buy alcohol, you have to buy it in beer, and you have to buy it in beer because there's two companies that control the alcohol consumption in Mexico. And they have to defeat the state 
and they had to defeat a whole number of things to get that position. So it's not speculation. If you do a sexual study, you'll find the, 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 where the royal power is exercised. No, no, I, I mean, I'm not debating that at all. I mean, I, I've, I, like I said, I think everyone agrees that all these corporations, that list of corporations, however we want to we aggregate the list, whether it's profit, assets, whatever, they're very powerful and they have, and that manifests in many, many different ways. But what I'm, what I'm arguing against is that we cannot quantify with exactitude that this corporation is this many times more powerful than, than the other. And I think that's I one of the things. That list you gave me, that, that it's not too bad. It is an indicator. Of but how do you how do you prove that to me? So how do you demonstrate that to me? Uh, if you're going to try to demonstrate that to me, we would have to assume. <laughs> <laughs> we are running out of time. So I'm just gonna make <laughs> I want to make one comment, yeah. which is very very important. What you did with all of those uh, with the lids is exactly what the Westphalian paradigm of international relations does. You take an assumption of A, self-reliance. Each one of these entities is a unit to itself. You take the assumption of unlimited capacity for growth, which is that all of these firms can continuously expand their power in terms of utility of market capitalization. And then you assume that in a certain equality amongst the actors in terms of sovereignty or, but none of those things are true. All those corporations are relational to each other's interest in terms of Nestle. You can't compare Nestle with Exxon, but you can see similarities in terms of their interactions and what their behaviors are and perhaps interlinkages and in all sorts of layers as to, in terms of pensions, those kind of uh, apparatuses. But those units are not comparable in the real world, and they're all linked to specific state capacities that make them, as opposed to, you had another slide there that basically said something to the effect that they're controlling the state, they're shaping the state. No, they are a creation of the state. They're an effect of the state. That's a very different thing, and you can't in social sciences compare unlike things and have any type of empirical or significant philosophical uh, relevance. So which is why, um, the Westphalian paradigm has basically been rejected by a majority of political scientists, even so far as realism is somewhat relevant, but it isn't really what's talked about anymore in our institutions. So I think you need to look at that issue. The thing is, I agree with just almost every single statement you just said, so maybe um, there's some miscommunication here. And, and the second thing that you said, you're saying that I assume that corporations have power into infinity or that growth, growth is infinite. I'm saying the exact opposite. I'm saying that it's dependent on, where, oh no, where are we? It's dependent on human will and choice. And, and, this, and this, relation, this power relationship, because it's dependent on human will and choice, it cannot be quantified and it's dependent on us to overcome. Yeah, if you don't mind, let's close this session. <laughs> thanks, Sean, and thanks to everybody.